Hello and welcome to this episode of the podcast. Today's subject will be David James Harker. He was a murderer. He had sex with a corpse. He claimed to have cooked and ate part of his victim. There was only the one victim. The murder took place on April in 1998. Uh, David himself was born in 1975. The victim was Julie Patterson, who was 32 years old. He killed her by strangulation and this took place in the north of England in the city of Darlington. In this podcast, I'll go through the final details of David's life and the murder itself. So if you do end up liking this video, please subscribe on YouTube. And if you're listening to this on Spotify, then please hit follow. I'm going to read out some newspaper articles that I found and then I'll give you my own opinion at the end. David James Harker was a complex man. To the many people who knew him, he could be intelligent, articulate, witty, caring and polite. And when it came to women, he could certainly turn on the charm. Women found him attractive and he had no difficulty getting sex. He had led a promiscuous sex life and even when he was in a relationship, found it difficult to remain faithful. But the 24 year old also had a darker side. He told lies to try and impress friends and needed to be constantly in control. And I think that's the theme of the crime he committed. This is a guy that craves control, but I'll come on to that later. When he couldn't be in control, it resulted in drink fueled tantrums, aggression, and ultimately violence. He spent much of his time in Stanhorn Park, which is in Darlington, uh, the north of England, as I mentioned, so drunk on strong cider that he was frequently sick. His fantasy to kill and obsession with serial murderers was at the center of his life. But even though he was widely known as saying everybody had either a V or an I on their chest to signify victim or innocent, nobody could have imagined the horror to which it would lead. Harker would spend hours in his flat in Harwood Grove reading macabre books and watching grisly videos. It has been said that he was more well read on serial killers than some forensic psychiatrists. Among the literature he read were books on how to evade questions in police interviews and how to survive in prison. We will never truly know if while reading, Harker was planning his own tale of butchery, or if Julie's death was simply a fantasy which went out of control during a drinking binge. If it was the latter, it may well be that in killing Julie, he surprised himself. The mutilation that followed could have been committed out of panic and desperation when he realized in the cold light of day what he had done. On the other hand, he could be a psychopath who had planned Julie's death all along. He has admitted to the police that he wanted to be a serial killer. His downfall was that he needed to brag. He told no less than 28 people what he had done to Julie. A friend, Mike Farrant, said that David had given himself the name Devilman and tried to live up to that image. As to the crime itself, David killed Miss Patterson after meeting her in a pub and taking her back to his flat in Darlington. He strangled her, then claimed that he cut strips of flesh from her, which he cooked and ate with pasta and cheese. He claimed to have had sex with the corpse before wiping it down with bleach and sewing off the head and limbs. He then dumped the torso in a bin bag on a wasteland near Darlington Football Club. Miss Patterson's head was never found. Now Harker was actually arrested when he told a whole bunch of people of what he did. He was boasting about it and a few of them realized he's actually telling the truth so they contacted the police. They found blood stains and some of her clothing in the basement of where David lived. Since his arrest, his appearance changed. He had gone from being a good looking, well built, strong man to a lanky, insipid and arrogant being who looks ill. He gives the impression of having spent years constructing an image of himself and is now doubtful if he even knows the real Harker anymore. In recent months, he has even taken on the appearance of what he thinks Harker, the butcher, should look like. His previously shaven head that revealed his tattooed scalp bearing the words subhuman and disorder is now thick with dark hair and he now boasts a full black beard giving him the look of one of the heroes, serial killer Peter Sutcliffe. Add to that his ice blue eyes and his frighteningly long sinuous fingers and he fits the bill perfectly. 
For him, it's all part of a role he's playing out, a character in a grisly horror, written by his own hand. Harker was brought up in 2nd Avenue, which is on Chesterler Street, by his mother Jacqueline and father Alan, along with his younger brother Stephen. He had a tempestuous relationship with his parents and had not spoken to them for months prior to his arrest. From a young age, he would torture and mutilate small creatures. His youthful problems came to a head when at the age of 16, he was sent to Dare Bolt Young Offenders Institution, which is in Barnard Castle in the county of Durham, for attacking two men and their dog. The dog later died. His parents have refused to comment about their eldest son. His mother, looking pale and drawn, would say that his family was aware of his inhumane nature and they were aware at the time that he was going to appear on court as they haven't spoken to them in a while but that she was tired of him and she wasn't interested. It seemed her unconditional love and maternal instincts had been worn away to leave nothing but heartache. Yet despite his drunken and abusive tendencies, Harker had a circle of friends both wide and varied. A talented skateboarder, the former punk had befriended a number of boys younger than himself, aged between 15 and 17, probably targeted by him because he felt he could impress them with lies and control them. Many of them feared him. At Stanholm Park, Harker would sit on a bench while youngsters, often as many as 15 years old, sat on the grass around him in a semicircle. He treated them like his disciples. He was also lead singer in a punk hardcore band named Downfall and was friends with a number of students at Queen Elizabeth Sixth Form College in Darlington. They did not drink like he did or have the same interest in violence, but they found him intelligent and good fun to be around. He was caring too. Prior to his arrest, Harker was planning to travel to India to do charity work and at one stage was even organizing a charity concert. Another friend, Stephen Crane of Harrison Terrace, again in Darlington, he said that one of the reasons I liked Harker was because he hated bigoted people like racists. He would always stick up for people who could not help their situation. He couldn't stand sex offenders and people who were horrible to children. And that all seems so strange now, knowing what he did to Julie Patterson. After Harker had finished with the previous girlfriend, who is the mother of his four-year-old son, he became depressed and ended up sleeping rough. And it's interesting there where his friend uh, Stephen said that David did not like sex offenders. Sometimes in life, I've said it before, nothing is ever what it seems. He did spend some time at Darlington YMCA. He would stay at a friend's house, even sleeping in a garden shed. It was his charm that always saw him through. 20-year-old Mr. Farrant offered him a place to sleep for a couple of nights at his parents' home in Orchard Road in the Danes area of Darlington. Mr. Farrant went on to say, He was such a nice guy. My mum and dad said he could stay for as long as he liked. He ended up with his own room and he was there for about six months. He did his bit around the house and always paid his way. If he borrowed money, he always made sure people got it back. He was polite and respectful. If he hadn't been, there is no way my parents would have let him stay that long. Now Stuart Bolton lived in the flat where Julie Patterson was killed immediately prior to David moving in. He moved out because a bigger apartment had become available. He met David on a few occasions and Harker even helped him move his furniture out the flat. Mr. Bolton said, I found him quite pleasant every time I spoke to him. In fact, he was fairly quiet, but you could see a crack in him where every time you have a chat. But I realized he had another side. When I saw him one night in the Tap and Spile in Darlington, which I think is a pub, he went on to a rage for some unknown reason and put his fist through a window. He was barred from a lot of pubs. Going back to the killing itself, Julie's remains were found in the garden of a derelict house. She was strangled with her own tights. Despite detectives searching through 20,000 tons of rubbish in rivers and ponds, her head and limbs were never found, despite pleas from her family to be allowed to give her a proper funeral. David Harker was given a life sentence with no chance of parole for 14 years, back in February 1999, 
after pleading guilty to the manslaughter of Julie on the grounds of diminished responsibility. Now, if we go, that, so as I said, that crime took place uh, in the late 90s. As of October of this year, in 2021, under Helen's law, which was enacted in January of 2021, it's harder for prisoners who refuse to disclose the body's location to get parole. Because of this, he was denied parole. And I think from David's point of view, he doesn't even remember where he left the body. And because he can't uh, tell the police where the remains are, you know, her limbs and the head, they won't uh, let him free. So I want to go back now to the notion of David craving control. I don't think it was control. I think it was power. They are, um, there's a thin line between control and power. I know that. But everyone likes to be in control. You know, we like to be in control of our own finances or in control of our own emotions right that's that's perfectly fine but power is a different breed power is when you're craving the servitude and the obedience of others you understand the difference now for example when he was in the park and he had those kids sitting around him and they would listen to everything he would say basically he's just a leader and he's given a sermon you understand what i'm saying right if you look at it in the in that in that context, I guess you can see that he just wanted to feel like he was something special. Couple that with him continuously reading about serial killers, he became obsessed. I read about serial killers, of course, but I'm not obsessed with them, right? Like, I get disgusted by them. He, on the other hand, became inspired by them. And I feel like the more he read, the more brainwashed he became, that he wanted to be the serial killers. This may sound weird, but you guys all watch Netflix. You all watch films. Sometimes we become enchanted and endeared with certain characters to the point where we think, hey, I might want to be like that. Right? I mean that in a good way. Right? Sometimes we see a film or a TV show and we think, wow, that's exactly the kind of person I want to be. Well, take that same notion. It seems like David wanted that, but in the serial killer sense. And I feel like his inner innocence, because a lot of people did say good things about him, his inner innocence became corrupted by all the material he was reading. And unfortunately, he took it out on Julie. He should never, ever be released from prison. Britain's laws generally do seem uh, less strict than America's. In America, you would never see the light of day again. But I do think in England, that's the same. I just think because... It's 22 years minimum, they say. I just think that's semantics for human rights reasons. I know it was a long time ago, but I do hope that Julie's family do feel a lot better. They've probably gotten used to it, but I don't think they'll ever get over it. Thank you for listening.